Part 2, Chapter 8, Retainer A metallic grind reverberated through the semi-vacant hallway through my locker door peeling open. The contents seemed detached from memory. Pens and pencils were well stocked, tucked neatly in a fabric sleeve that hung on the inside of the door. Lining the walls were a couple of drawings I had done throughout the year that weren't entirely garbage. A small mirror my dad bought me remained, though I avoided its reflection. This locker was not as personalized as some students prefer, but enough to know that this space is mine and mine alone. Hanging on the small hook was a long-sleeved shirt I wore weeks prior. It smelled like old perfume and paper. I removed it from the nagging hook and stuffed it into my bag to be brought home and washed. The bell had already rung, but I had no intention of going to class. I needed time to myself, so my plan was to sit in the lunchroom and wait, take stock and locate the center of myself. The encounter with Joey was unavoidable. I just wish it had been done after school instead, my fault for not tackling it sooner. Still, my nerves were on high alert, breathing stout, heart ticking rapidly, skin crawling. I had to keep myself distant to avoid this demon's harsh desires. Setting my bag on the ground, I pulled both arms through the overly long sleeves and removed his jacket. Holding it in front of me, I admired the stitching in the leather, the red inner lining and popped collar. I smiled so wide that it made my cheeks hurt. I hung the jacket up on the hook and placed my fingers on the sleeve, gliding them down and closing the door. In the hall where I stood, I saw two or three other kids just getting to their locker or closing it and rushing along. I started my slow walk to the lunchroom, each step taken with minimal haste. I passed many doors, some open with a lecture boasted into the hall, most closed and only visible through the small windows every door had. I peeked through those gaps without slowing down and caught glances from other people, though I wasn't fully looking at them, just looking in general. Every so often I would catch Alice's face in the reflection. She was present, but reserved. I knew she was watching me, observing my feelings, and soaking in the electric atmosphere. All this stress and negativity was like inhaling vitamin vapor. I'm surprised she was being so complacent. Perhaps she was amassing, and planning. Only she knows. I reached the end of this hall and turned left down another long stretch with only lockers and two bathrooms. No one else was around and I instantly felt relief with the open space. However, it wouldn't last long. As I rounded the corner, I heard one of the classroom doors open and close behind me. It wasn't worth noting, so I continued along. A new dilemma burrowed its way into my head. When the lunchroom fills with students, I will probably be confronted by at least a few other kids. Neutral people that exchanged greetings and short conversations with me on occasion. Maybe Tonsu and Joey will sit outside with me, get some fresh air, and forget about it all. That thought brought a hopeful gleam to my eyes, and yet there was a pit in my stomach, a tinge in my chest that almost felt like a warning. Then it occurred to me, in the shadow of my own footsteps was another set trailing me. It wasn't obvious at first, but it became all too clear when I slowed my own steps to let them pass, and they didn't. The distance remained the same, and the dynamic charge around me was consistent. I stopped. As expected, the pitter-patter behind me came to a halt as well. I listened, gathering hints and feelings of who it was that would be following so close behind. It was sickeningly familiar, obvious to anyone with an inkling of our history. I would be stupid not to recognize that very particular presence. I closed my eyes. My entire mood shifted. It's true. You're back. Stacy opened the conversation. My eyes slowly peeled open, and I turned around to see her standing ten feet away. Her arms were loose by her sides, and there was no purse or handbag over her shoulder. In her hand was a large key ring with a laminated tag on it, a hall pass. I don't want to talk to you. Leave me alone, I said in monotone. She inched closer. Can you spare a minute? I'm serious, Stacy. Back off. I could feel Alice looking through my eyes. Hmm. Her blood is flowing so smoothly, she looks like a gusher. When Alice spoke, I got a jolt of cynicism. 
My lower lip trembled, holding back a wide grin. I kept myself steady and let that feeling subside. Stacy began, speaking in an odd sincerity that I didn't think she was capable of. Look, I saw you through the door, and I have some things to say. Her voice was docile, gestures minimal. This ought to be good. My voice was rigid, irate. She looked more tired than I'd ever seen. She wasn't wearing her usual snide expression or confident pose, almost humble. It was clear to anyone that my defenses were raised. An invisible barrier of distrust and hate kept us purposefully distant. I wanted to offer my condolences, firstly. She emitted zero hostility. My jaw unhinged, and my expression lessened. Oh? She nodded uncomfortably. I've been thinking about calling you, but realize you probably wouldn't be at home, so I figured it best to wait until I see you to say it. My heart began racing, confused and scared of her true intentions. There was always a trick. Don't trust her. Never trust her. Alice stepped up and started prodding my mind. Do you honestly think she feels any remorse? It's a ploy. She wants to weaken you like before. With her words came a chill that twisted my spine and caused my breathing to shake. I couldn't look her in the eye. Instead, choosing to look at the floor. Irritation spiked all at once, left over from my previous conversation. And, second, I wanted to say, you know, if there's anything you need, to let me know. The words dribbled from her lips, stiff and callous, but trying. I side-eyed her, gloom darkening my stare. What the hell are you playing at? I said distrustfully. She gave a look that wanted to appear offended, but retracted it. Dutifully so. Come on, Kim. I'm trying, okay? I've given it a lot of thought, and I know how shitty I've been to you. I'm done with all that, and I just wanted to step away with one good deed. Done with it. Really? My posture hunched, facing her completely with a curl in my upper lip. Then why were you picking on Tansu? She bit her tongue. That was a lapse in judgment. I don't know why I was doing that, but if she didn't already tell you, I stopped on Monday. She then got a little annoyed. Whether it was at me or herself, I wasn't sure. Look, if you don't want to accept that I'm moving on, then that's your problem. I'm just trying to be the bigger person. Her words were less sincere and rushed. Tch, the bigger person, I repeated. Underneath my skin, I was squirming. Rationality was just out of reach, and the coddled rage spawned from our past bubbled like a boiling pot. It spread to every muscle, every bone. My body was getting hot, and my hair stood on end. Alice mocked. You're joking. How many times did she make you apologize for nothing? And yet, she can't even muster the word herself. Delusional to think a white flag would suffice in place of that which she pried from you every day. So proud. I swallowed, toes curling and nostrils flared. I didn't need Alice to pump me with demented confidence. I was already there at the sight of her. I always was, but never had the means to express it. A tingle spread in my veins, like a sandstorm cloud of needles. She was fueling me but I didn't care. However, one single thread of conscience held me back. While a part of me was fighting to stay myself, I had forgotten the reason. Searching through the archives of who I am revealed no motive, nothing to keep me from this. It was all a blur, and for a second or two, I had forgotten my name. All I could see was Stacy and everything she had ever done to me. How badly I wanted to pry the sorry from her lips. Every shove, curse, and prank, no matter how small at the time, it all coagulated into a veiny red glob of hatred. I could taste the blood on my tongue. I could see the events as they were about to play out in beautifully graphic slow motion. Frame by frame, her face peeled away and splashed to the floor. Stacy rotated on an axis and started to walk away the way she came. Whatever, Kim. I tried. My head twisted and compressed with confusion. 
A sudden shockwave of dissonant fury soaked into my pores. Alice's words slithered. Step into the river, and I'll carry you to the other side. Just a step. I felt an uncontrollable pressure seize my muscles. The microwaving buzz in my brain urged my feet forward, slowly. My head hung low, and my shoulders were slumped. Then, a burst of power from within hurtled me forward, and I reached out for her shoulder. Spinning her around with violent force, I met her eyes with mine. I drank all the shock in her face, and could sense her fear as she leaned back. I jabbed my finger at her nose, teeth flared like a rabid dog. After everything you've done, you think you can just declare this over and walk away? I snarled. Go fuck yourself, Stacy. You can take your pity and shove it. She gave a frightened glare, and confusion warped her words. Whoa, that was a bit harsh, Kim. I know this doesn't... Doesn't what? Make up for the bullshit that never had a reason or explanation? I threw depravity at her face. It doesn't even come close. I planted my feet on the floor, my voice growing louder, more distorted. She raised her own voice, clinging to her proud self over caution. Fine. You know what? I'm... She clamped her mouth shut, eyes flared. My jaw shifted. What? Spit it out. No, I'm going to be the bigger person here. I'm trying to start fresh, but you're being a jerk. Oh, my apologies if I'm coming off negatively towards the one other person who made my life a fucking living hell. My voice crackled. Alice chortled. You're still apologizing to her. I whipped my head halfway around, as if I expected to see Alice looking over my shoulder. Shut up, Alice! Stacy recoiled, perplexed but swiftly recovered her stance. She shook her head as I turned back to face her, and she retreated a step. What were you going to say? I saw her throat bounce with hasty gulps, tears in her eyes, and a redness painted her face. She crossed her arms and glared at me. She spoke, a lot quieter than before. I'm glad he's gone. Her eyes shifted to the side, then looked back at me, sincere. You don't deserve to be going through this. I really wanted to help. Maybe start fresh. But your dad was a damn menace around town. A menace to my family and friends. So it sucks that he is dead, but I'm relieved. Those were the words she said, but that's not what I heard. I heard something similar and far more vicious. Hateful vitriol entangled in giggles and taunts. My skull began compressing, and the color around the edges of my vision warbled. Say. My voice wasn't entirely my own. There was some filter breaking through, static and low. Say you're sorry. A croaking bubbled in my throat. I didn't realize I whispered it, so she didn't fully hear me. She leaned in, waiting for me to repeat myself, but I didn't. She rolled her eyes and sighed. Kim, I'll talk to you another time. Whenever, just let me know. But I'm not going to do this when you're acting all crazy. I lost control for just a moment, but a moment was all she needed. In a split second, my fist went from being ball by my side to vaulting at her face. Three knuckles contacted her lower jaw, lashing her head to the side with a snapping force. The crack of impacting bone broke the air, and a splash of blood launched to the floor and painted my knuckle. She staggered a step backward, and then fell down onto her tailbone. The impact was so fast, so sudden, that her brain hadn't yet caught up with the pain. She held her jaw, shaking as a deep purple bruise began to form. What the fuck, Kim? Dazed and confused, she lifted herself up on one shaky arm and wiped the blood from her split lip. I didn't realize right away, but the whites of my eyes were now a shallow black, and my irises were glowing purple. But Stacy didn't see my eyes. Her vision and mine were dazed from the long overdue punch. I can't believe you just hit me! Like, really? Before she could get another word, I was taking a full stride in her direction and throwing another fist her way. This punch collided with the side of her head, knocking her flat on the ground again. My eyes were wide, demonic, and lacking any humanity or sympathy. In my head was a rainstorm of memories, splashing my brain like battery acid. 
every insult she ever threw at me, every physical altercation paired with that of my father. They worked in tandem, coiling around each other as drilling forces content on ripping me apart, but I felt calm, in a way. I crammed my fist around her neck, lifting her up off the floor. She gasped for air and wrapped her hands around my wrist, trying to pry it apart. Kim, what are you... Let, let me go, she begged. I looked into her eyes again, and she could see mine for what they were. The terror set in. Say you're sorry. Taunting, broken, I wanted to cry. I gave a devilish grin, and Alice released a high-pitched cackle that broke free from my soul and echoed through the halls. The lights in the hallway began to flicker rapidly until some of the bulbs burst with a deafening pop. The glass rained down upon us, lining the floor with hundreds of razor shards and a rhythmic clattering. The newfound veil of black shrouded us in what felt like a new world, completely detached from the school. The toxic power that flowed through me was seeping out into the hallway. Some locker doors began to slightly crunch inward, and posters taped to the concrete walls tore and fell down. Sweltering energy spawned an invisible whirlwind of pure hatred, with me at the center, hair thrown all around. I tied my fingers around her throat, silencing her gasps and removing her ability to breathe. She clawed at my arms, trying to break free, but her nails couldn't penetrate my skin. She opened her mouth wide, squealing. Out of nowhere, I felt a stabbing pain in my spine, which caused me to drop her. She hit the floor with a gasp, messily prone beneath my looming shape. I cringed forward as my bones began to stretch. I was suddenly stricken with realization, an encroaching consequence. A sharp whispering exhale barely foreign words. No, 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 no. I gripped my own skull, stricken by awareness but unable to do anything about it. Stacy watched in disbelief as my hair began to lengthen and turn black. Every single strand stretched and pulled away from my scalp, drawing small beads of blood to the surface and rolling down the side of my head. My fringe now covered my eyes, but the glow of my irises shined through the gaps. My skin was overcome by the deep, light gray tone, and my mouth dripped blood to the floor as the stitches sealed my lips together. Flashes of my dad, Destro, and all the nightmares they had afflicted accelerated what was already happening submerging me in a black pond of dirty water. Horrified and baffled, Stacy attempted to shriek, but her crushed windpipe would not allow any more than a muted grunt. What are you? Silence. I shut my eyes and lifted my head, letting an easy breath push to the ceiling. When they opened, they were shining purple and black, hazy with hungry intent on the surface. I looked down at her, no longer myself. A grin split across my face. A nightmare. Stacy slid back a few inches, her body mostly unresponsive. Amused, I stepped forward and reached out, pressing my palm against her collarbone. The icy chill of my skin stole the heat from her body. Her breathing hastened as I slid my fingertips behind the fragile bone and paused. With minimal effort, I ripped my hand back and snapped her collarbone like a twig. Horrendous screams erupted from her chest, and her hand shot up to the protruding bone. Stop screaming! I shouted with a gurgling moan and punched her in the chest, knocking the wind out of her. Numb vibrations nestled in my ears, like cotton roaches digging a tunnel. Before her screams could start again, I gripped her head tightly and planted her face on the floor. Small shards of glass dug into her skin as she attempted to pull away. She struggled wriggling like a worm cut in half. Then I proceeded to drag her face across the floor through the abundance of glass. The razor dust stabbed and tore through her flesh, layer by layer, leaving a trail of deep red blood. Her cries were muffled by the lack of air and the floor beneath her mouth. At the end of the drag, I raised her head up a few inches, and she took a moment to inhale deeply, shuddering with insurmountable pain and confusion. But there would be no reprieve. Not so soon. As she drew her breath, I smashed her face back down to the floor. Her head bounced off the cheap tiles, and a loud crack filled the hallway from the impact. She stopped moving. I released her head and ogled at her bloody face as it lay on the side. 
I delicately placed my palm over her ear and jostled her head side to side, then stood myself upright. An evil grin decorated my face as I absorbed the scene. What I personally saw was a dream, a twisted fantasy I concocted after a brutal day of mistreatment, something I would go on to regret even considering. But here, in the real world, Stacy was dying. Right then, the bell rang. I raised my head and followed the noise as it raced through the concrete halls. Anxiety set in, then was overtaken by enthrallment. Alice grinned. A twitch caught my attention. The bell must have shaken her senses because her eyes started to open, though it was clear she was in a traumatized daze. I watched her arms and legs come to life, and her body slowly started to receive proper signals. A shaken flood her pulse from her lips, but that was all. I don't think she was fully lucid, seeing how she shakingly attempted to rise as if she had just fallen asleep on the couch. Alice raised an eyebrow, impressed. Wow, look at you. Guess that tough girl shit isn't entirely an act. Stacy somehow managed to get to a down dog position, barely able to hold her head up. Her arms trembled uncontrollably. The sight of her face dripping blood into a growing pool beneath was exhilarating, empowering. I lifted my leg the slightest amount and pushed her over with a light thud. Oops. Alice giggled. Stacy limply fell to the floor and rolled onto her back. Her mouth opened wide and she did her absolute best to breathe and contain herself. Please, stop. She cried like a scared child. Alice sighed disappointed with her resolve. And just how many times have you been asked to stop? I know. Her chest bellowed, words bouncing with the sobbing tears. Her chest rose and fell rapidly, terror animated. Every word was slurred and fragmented. I'm a piece of shit. I did so many horrible things to you and I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. She hollered blubbering with her face soaked in bloody tears. Then, a tender whisper. Please, I want my mom. I leaned down to her level, placing my lips close to her ear, and pushed a hot breath. So do I. I felt my fingertips burn as jagged, one-inch talons breached the surface. Then, I felt a new presence. Lifting my head on high alert, I directed my gaze down the hall where we had come from. Around the corner was still well lit, so I could see a shadow on the wall as this person approached the corner. I watched carefully as they turned and stopped the moment their eyes met the dusty black. What in the world? The voice was asking out loud, referring to the damaged lights. Blurry and concealed, I stood above Stacy's immobilized body and turned fully toward them. A deep shadow was cast over the left side of his body from the hallway light above. It was the history teacher. Mr. Kell. I closed my eyes and sensed every inch of the surrounding dark. Mr. Kell, oblivious to the horror beyond the veil, stepped into the darkness. His feet crunched on broken glass, but he persisted forward. As he drew nearer, I stepped to the side and aligned myself with the locker doors. My right hand tensed. Slowly, silently, a single nail grew out of my pointer finger, longer than the others, until the tip hovered above the floor. He was a few feet from us and stopped. His vision had adjusted enough to see somebody on the floor. His heartbeat was audible to me, as was the fleshy, wet shifting of his eyes. Holding my breath, I remained undetected to his left and watched as he leaned forward. Is that? He started. Erupting from the shadows, I threw my single claw at his neck and slashed right through, leaving him staggering to the side, gripping his throat. Hot red blood spat out with force and painted my face and teeth, instantly sending my clawing spirit back to my father's final moments. All balance evaporated and his frightened body thrashed into the other lockers. Gurgling loudly, the hot red fluid emptied from his veins and soaked his shirt in seconds. He looked around desperately when his eyes caught the glint of my own. Open wide with satisfaction, I watched him fall to the floor with a thud. Alice spoke, her voice electric and sharp. Your soul is dirty. I can feel the despair and regret. Shame, it isn't much, 
but I'll take it all, she stated and then fully extended her other claws. Kells stared desperately at us as the life rushed to escape his body, helpless to do anything about it. With claws fully unsheathed, I motioned to finish him off. Just as I threw my claws at his chest, I felt the tiniest gust of wind brush past my face. Within a blink, a new silhouette stood between the two of us. The new arrival had a tight grip around my wrist, stopping my attack just an inch short. My arm trembled as I continued to apply force. Then I felt a cooling wave of new energy rinse over my skin, and instantly, my offense turned to defense. Attempting to pull my arm away, I caught a peculiar glimpse. In the dark, I could see the glow of another Tuffle's eyes beneath a dense hood. Impossible! There's no way you could have snuck up on me, Alice stated worriedly. This character didn't respond. Most details were lost beneath the hood, but given their shape and stance, I determined they were likely a boy. His eyes were fixated on ours, but strangely enough, there was no hostility, no blaring in my ears. I barely managed to spit out a few words. Is it Destro? Alice shook her head, but said nothing. He seemed docile, all except for his grip, which was unlikely to escape without extreme force. His other hand carefully separated from his side, extending to press flat against Kel's draining neck and collect the blood in his palm. Simultaneously, our ears perked up as doors were heard opening and a soft clamoring approached the same corner Kel had come from. Both of our heads whipped to the side, but the stranger took this chance to do something unexpected. He lifted his free hand, now dripping Kel's blood, and directed a single fingertip to my forehead. A soft purple glow emitted from the tip and vanished into my skin as he jabbed me. In that motion, my body tripled in weight and a crippling dizziness squeezed my head. Disoriented, I stumbled in place while he held me by the wrist. Shit! Out of nowhere, a blinding white light sprouted from nothing to my left. I glanced over and was absorbed by the enveloping glow that seemed to cast no shadow and had minimal effect on the darkness around us. The light morphed into a standing rectangle. A door. It opened inward and released a mist that rolled along the ground. The stranger spoke very low, glancing at the bodies. This is all my fault. Forgive me. Another echo, soft and hidden beneath layers of perception. We have no choice. With force, the boy tossed us limply through the doorframe with surprising strength. We landed on what seemed to be the softest sand I had ever felt. The shock he introduced had dissipated, but was quickly replaced by a new agony. Lying on my side in this blinding area, I angled my head back through the doorway where I could see the stranger illuminated by the effervescent light. He looked at me with patient eyes and a tight-lipped frown. His purple eyes dimmed and revealed the gentle green beneath. It was him, the boy I had seen standing in the halls. The boy who had told me not to worry about Stacy. Peering through the door, I glanced past him and saw the approaching crowd moving to their next class, drawn by a dark hallway and strange noises. Someone screamed, and he turned to face them. Then, the door shut without making a sound. All at once, the gravity around me started to crush my body. A furious thrashing of every cell in me seized and exploded down to my very core. It was the most painful thing I had ever felt, and left me too crippled to instigate any movement. Thankfully, Alice still had control over my body. Alice! I screamed in agony, voice broken. Hold on, her voice echoed. She then rolled onto her stomach and spotted another door fifteen or so feet away. She dug her elbows into the sand and began crawling frantically, desperately with every fiber of her being. Every second that passed, I could feel my existence being snuffed away. The blood which painted my skin flaked off and floated freely in the air before turning to dust, cleansing me. Looking through the layer of black over my eyes, I started to sink inside my own consciousness, fading and falling into an infinite loop. Everything, even parts of me that I never knew I could feel, were experiencing an agonizing, gouging sensation that left me unable to speak, think, or react in any way besides watch as the door drew closer. With a final effort, Alice dug one foot into the ground 
and launched herself the closing distance and busted through the door. We rolled out, back into the real world, and hit the floor with my full body weight. 